<laughs> so welcome to everybody. Thanks for coming out in the cold weather this evening. I'm Cliff Connor. I'm a member of Science for the People. And I've been an anti-nuclear activist for a long time, opposing both military mm. and civilian manifestations of nuclear power. I recently saw a documentary by the famous Oliver Stone called Nuclear Now. And then I heard about Jan's atomic bamboozle and found out that Science for the People was sponsoring showings in other parts of the country. So we here in New York thought we should do the same. Uh, speaking of Science for the People, I want to call to your attention that one of the main voices in the film we just watched, the physicist M.V. Romana, who is the last fellow you saw, uh, is a good friend of Science for the People with whom we've collaborated before. Now let me introduce you to the panelists. We had hoped to have Jan with us in person tonight, but you've already heard a couple of times that she's snowed in in Portland, Oregon, and unable to get here. The good news is that she can join us from cyberspace via Zoom, which <laughs> is the next best thing to having her here in person. Jan is a clinical psychologist, professor emeritus of psychology at Portland State University, and an award-winning documentary filmmaker. In addition to the film we just watched, her recent films include Oil, Water, and Climate Resistance, and Climate Justice and the Thin Green, green Line. Another of our panelists is Joshua Frank. Some of you may have seen Josh here at the People's Forum before. Uh, he gave a book talk here less than a year ago when his book, Atomic Days, was published. Uh, you saw a lot in this film about Hanford, Washington, and that's, if you had never heard of that before, you're not alone. Uh, this is a book that will tell you everything you want to know about Hanford, Washington, and the nuclear problems that it represents. Uh, Hanford, Washington, as Josh says in the book, is the most toxic place in the Western Hemisphere due to the nuclear waste left over from the Manhattan Project's primary plutonium producing plant. Josh obviously has a lot to say about the problem of nuclear waste, among other things that are relevant to the film. And our third panelist is Ray Atchison. Ray is the director of Reaching Critical Will, which is the disarmament program of the w Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Ray also serves on the steering group of ICAN, or ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Um, we don't have that. Uh, well, there's a graphic I wanted to show you. Let's see if it comes up. There it is. Uh, ICANN, which uh, was uh, won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for its work to ban nuclear weapons. Ray is also on the steering committees of Stop Killer Robots and the International Network on Explosive Network uh, Weapons. Ray is the author of two books, two recently published books. One is Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy, and the other is Abolishing State Violence. And the good news is that I think we have this on sale upstairs, right? And the other one as well? I don't know this one. Oh, okay. Here. Anyway, this is a good one. <laughs> um, okay, I'm, I'm going to begin by posing one question to each of the panelists. And after we hear their responses, it'll be your turn to comment on the film or what the panelists say or to address questions to the panel. Uh, if you make a comment or uh, address a question, please restrict it to two minutes so that anybody who, everybody who wants to participate will have a chance to do so. I'll be taking three questions at a time and also the microphone 
will be brought to you. So, Jan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, loud and clear. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Jan, your scientific field is psychology. Tell us, please, how your training in psychology intersects with the problems your film addresses. How does the nuclear power industry and its claims look through the lens of psychology? Well, my uh, all of my documentaries over a period of a, a couple decades um, came out of my field research and particularly settings where groups were coming together to confront difficult social problems and sites of uh, conflict and, and uh, strategies of resistance. So um, the last two films you mentioned focus on the uh, necessity defense, groups in different regions of the country using the necessity defense and civil disobedience as a strategy in the, in the uh, climate movement. And both were uh, guided by indigenous perspectives on the climate crisis located in regions um, that where there are deep attachments to place and to um, other living and non-living beings. Um, and so I, um, I was interested, this film came out of the second of the two necessity films, which features Kathy Sampson Cruza, who you saw here um, in this film. She um, would often be speaking at rallies, um, resisting fossil fuel infrastructure, trains and terminals. And she would say, don't forget nuclear. <laughs> uh, it's not as visible in its effects as fossil fuels, but uh, we tend to forget about the horrible legacy of nuclear power and its perpetual promises to revive itself, to resurrect itself in a new form. And a lot of my work also focuses on memory in forms of cultural amnesia. So I became really interested in how this industry perpetually um, promises in quite ecstatic ways um, itself as the answer to the problems we face, including the climate emergency. And as I looked into um, this history, I um, and was doing research on these small modular reactors, which I knew nothing about before this project started a year and a half ago. Um, I, I was um, struck by how the internet was just flooded with these promotional videos and pitches and TED Talks listing the uh, and promising this form of energy that many of us thought was on its last legs, a dying industry, and reviving itself uh, again, um, this re renaissance, actually, the renaissance talk has been around since the early 2000s. So um, as a psychologist, I became interested in how in the propaganda of this industry, how they have been able to pitch these small modular reactors in a more in a more domesticated, almost feminine <laughs> um technology to distance themselves from the legacy of the, the big uh, reactor towers that are so iconic. And so it became for me partly a project of um, looking at the psychology of propaganda um, and also how the industry itself has used psychology to cast anti-nuclear activists as you know kind of old people who are really not up with the times of new technologies that um, smart people are going to figure out the problems down the road and so i came very interested in these inner uh, generational dynamics and how the industry itself is using uh, psychological means of promoting itself and repressing its own history. So it was a way of, I guess, putting nuclear power on the couch through this film project. And I think paying uh, tribute to the history of anti-nuclear activism that continues um, to do all of this work that's so important in envisioning a more rational and more humane and more just 
future. Thanks, Jan. So I've got a question for Josh here. Josh, you recently wrote an article that appeared in The Nation magazine entitled The Looming Threat of Israel's Nuclear Option. Tell us what the abominable assault on Gaza has to do with nuclear power. Wow. <laughs> it's tough to follow. Always tough to follow up, Jan, especially with a tough question. Um, I, I touched on the re in, in my open remarks about how this technology between nuclear power and nuclear weapons is so intricately connected, not only at a political level, um, a policy level, and an economic level, um, but that looming threat that Jan's talking about um, is persistent today, and it's persistent in regional conflicts. Uh, Israel is a nuclear power. Um, they have never allowed any international uh, weapons inspectors into their facilities. Um, they've never publicly admitted that they have these weapons, yet they want other uh, countries in the Middle East uh, that are pursuing nuclear technologies like Iran, um, Pakistan obviously has weapons, um, hold them to a higher standard than themselves. Uh, we've seen this play out in Gaza right now with the genocide taking on, taking place there. And I think it's important to understand that Gaza is, uh, by and large, a testing ground for weapons, uh, for American-made weapons, weapons that our tax dollars are funding. Um, and, and the nuclear uh, technology that, that Israel has um, is a threat. Uh, I don't think that any of us should underestimate what this government in Israel with carte blanche uh, support by our own government is capable of. Um, we've seen a complete decimation of an entire people. Um, I don't think any of us have to, to wait for the answer from the International uh, Court of Justice to understand that this is a genocide taking place. And now we know that this war in the Middle East is expanding. Uh, we know that there has been skirmishes uh, with Lebanon. Now we know Iran and Pakistan are going back and forth. We know that Iran has struck uh, facilities in Syria. We know, of course, that the U.S. is uh, going after the Houthis in Yemen. Um, so we don't know what the future holds. And if we were to pursue this ridiculous idea of rolling out thousands of these small modular reactors uh, across the planet, uh, which immediately enhances the abilities of these countries to produce nuclear weapons, uh, these risks only escalate. And so I, I think it's really important to look at these con these conflicts in that context. That um, the the more energy nuclear energy that we we produce, um, the more potential for nuclear catastrophe. Not only because of a meltdown, um, but also because of proliferation issues as well. Thanks, Josh. So, a question for Ray. You have alluded to a sort of dual mythology of the benefits of civilian, civilian nuclear energy and the benefits of nuclear weapons. On the other hand, uh, on the one hand, the nuclear energy industry claims to offer us a way out of the climate crisis. And on the other hand, the weapons industry says it offers us nuclear deterrence. Are these related? Hi, everybody. Um, there's a bit of an echo. Yes? OK. But I understand Jan needs us to use the mic. It's really distracting. Is everyone else annoyed? <laughs> I think it's because it's also coming through. Yeah. You can turn me off. <laughs> that any better? Oh, maybe a little. Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, okay. So there's absolutely a relationship between the propaganda that we are hearing from the nuclear power industry that the film articulated so well, and the mythology around nuclear weapons as a tool for protection. And both of these are predicated on this idea that nuclear technology can save the world whilst putting the world in grave peril. So the mythology of nuclear deterrence says that the capacity to destroy the planet 
is what keeps the planet safe, right? And that the ability to annihilate entire cities and to wipe out hundreds of thousands of people with a single bomb is the one and only thing that will prevent others from doing that. It's completely absurd. Uh, you know, if we develop the capacity to do something, it doesn't prevent that thing from happening. It's the only thing that enables it to actually happen. Um, and then, of course, as with nuclear energy, there's so many different harms that are produced by nuclear weapons, even without a single weapon ever being dropped. And many of them are the exact same that the film articulated in terms of energy. So harm to humans, animals, plants, water, and air from uranium mining, from the milling and processing of the fuel, uh, to the construction of the bombs or the facilities themselves, to the radioactive waste storage, to the leaks and the accidents. Um, and then of course, also with nuclear weapons, you have testing, um, which is not really testing, it's actually detonation of nuclear bombs. And we've had more than 2000 of those around the world. Um, and all of this has disproportionately harmed indigenous communities and poor communities of color globally around the world. Um, but the other thing that I just wanted to mention that nuclear energy and nuclear weapons have in common is resistance. And so the film did a great job of showcasing a lot of the really successful movements against nuclear energy. Um, but I also wanted to point out that, of course, ICANN, which was highlighted earlier, is built on an anti-nuclear movement that has been going since 1945 um, and most recently resulted in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which was um, adopted in 2017, entered into force in 2021, and the third anniversary is Monday. So it's a great time to get involved, um, and there's an active campaign here in New York City. Um, so it's a derivative of ICANN. It's called NICANN because we're really clever. I see Maze sitting there, Kathleen sitting here. If you want to get involved in anti-nuclear organizing in New York City, those are the people to talk to. Um, there's a great divestment effort with legislation um, with the New York City Council right now to actually take New York City pension funds away from uh, nuclear weapon producers. And Kathleen and another campaigner had an article in Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists recently about that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of active, amazing organizing going on right now. Um, so like Josh said, this is not an issue of the past. This is an issue for now. Thank you. Uh, we got, we're off to a good start with the discussion, so let me see if anyone in the audience, I see one hand already. Let me take three questions. Don't expect me to restate the questions. So you three, including Jan, uh, pay close attention because I'm not going to be restating. We just have to have whoever's asking a question to talk into the mic. That way Jan right. can hear us or hear you. So are you going to? OK. So one is right there. Hello, hello. Um, <clears throat> terrific film and talks. Uh, two things. One is just a comment uh, it, that just occurred to me. The um, thing about from the nuclear power industry saying, oh, we don't need these big, gigantic, scary reactors. We have these now small, modular things, and they're friendly and so on. On nuclear weapons, we, we always think of you know, this massive destruction they can cause, but the U.S. government, and I believe the Russian government has threatened, and, and others, we now have tactical nuclear weapons, nice, small, friendly nuclear weapons that can be targeted like our precision bombs, which we know are not very precise. So I was thinking that's a very analogous thing. Question. Um, I, 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 I'm totally convinced, I'm not for developing nuclear power. At the same time, we know that the burning of fossil fuels, uh, gas and oil, uh, they always call it natural gas, nothing so natural about it, but it is leading to catastrophic climate change. Uh, 
uh, wind and solar and uh, whatever, you know, th those are terrific, but they're not enough to provide the uh, energy needs that we have on this planet. So what what is the, uh, where do you go from there? Particularly if you're, let's say you're a, um, a very poor country. Many African countries have no electricity at all. And they need to get into the modern age to be able to have industry, to be able to educate their populations. What can we say to them? If, don't do nuclear, don't burn oil, don't burn coal, uh, but wind and solar and so on are not going to be enough. So it's, you know, it's a quandary I'm trying to figure out. Anybody else want to add a question? And is, is that working, by the way? Uh, John can hear the question. Okay, good. Yeah, I, 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 heard, I heard the questions. The question. And now we have the second question. Maybe some of you have the exact figures, but I heard uh, from a Canadian scientist who studies complexity is that uh, in the last uh, few decades, agricultural output increased four times. Did you get it? Agricultural output increased four times to feed the population that also increased uh, similarly. But the energy needed for this increased 80 times, eight zero. Now, I don't assume this to be the gospel. And also, I, I think it's difficult to calculate exactly how much energy you use for agriculture alone. I think there are a lot of peripheral things that go along with that too. But uh, the thing is, many decades were lost when both left and right ignored uh, population issues for whatever reason. I'm not guilty of that. And at this point, we also have an opportunity to say at least that this can't go on, this shouldn't go. And this is in part to an answer to Africa. There is not a single country in Africa uh, that is not growing in terms of population. What is the excuse for this? Most people don't dare to ask questions like this. Even Egypt, which used to feed a lot of the Western world uh, through millennia, is not sufficient in terms of agricultural produce. Why? All the countries uh, that uh, the Nile passes through are growing. The Nile is not growing. And nobody dares to say, well, what are you thinking, guys? Thank you. Is there a third question before we turn to the panelists? Seeing no hands, why don't we just start with those two? Uh, you want to begin? Uh, are you looking at me? Go ahead. Yes. Um, the I I think the questions both have a sense of the urgency that many, if not most, of us are feeling about the climate crisis. So we have very different and their range of analyses of the sources of the problem of the climate emergency and how social systems, the economies we've developed contribute to these crises. Um, it was striking to me how many of the ads that I followed or pitches for nuclear solutions to the climate crisis, many of which are being pitched in um, countries that are um, have very fragile state structures, regulatory systems, um, and are not in any way equipped to handle the long-term commitments that are required in managing nuclear energy, and yet are sold this out of a sense of um, desperation. And I, I think it's obscene, actually, how many of these um, designs, nuclear designs are, are being sold around the world to countries that are in very difficult situations where this is not going to at all meaningfully help them address 
the problems they face. And it's kind of like what social scientists term a forced choice dilemma. Well, do you want this or that? Do you want fossil fuels and all of the the dirt pollution and and um, choking of the planet, or do you want nuclear? And um, it, that limits our thinking about how the economic systems we live under um, constrain our vision and constrain our our ability to think through difficult problems and even how much energy you need to sustain the kind of global economy and supply chains that are attached to it, um, the consumer culture that is encouraged through the systems we live under. So I do think it's important to be able to avoid or resist these distractions like the shiny new objects that are sold um, as a form of deliverance. Um, these are clearly serious problems we face um, globally as well as locally. But I think as a start, it's important, as Ramana said, to not be seduced by false solutions that distract us from the systemic aspects of, of the climate crisis. Any other, or should we go for more questions? Right. Okay, any other comments, questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd like you to, if you could, um, address the question is often uh, the solution of nuclear is often tied into the idea that was earlier expressed that solar and wind can't really power our economies. And uh, that, <clears throat> and there's various arguments about that. One is that they are quote unquote intermittent, and so the question is, can nuclear be? And Ramana talked about that a little bit as a problem, but I would like to hear you talk about it. Um, those of you who have thought about this question, what do you? Uh, how do you argue that? As Dan said, this is a, a false dichotomy, and there are alternatives besides nuclear to sub to allow uh, renewable energy to work. And we have a question down here. Thank you thank you so much, Jan, for your film. It's really moving and tells a really complex um, story and with brevity, you know, I, I think that that's also um, really important. You can bring that into schools and um, educate young people. So, um, and thank you all for this August panel, um, bringing the two issues together, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, which we often don't do. Um, and that is my question to you all. How can we really streamline that argument because the connections between nuclear power and nuclear weapons to those of us who study this are very, very clear. But even in the movement, um, we find um, a sort of two camps, you know, people that are like, oh, I deal with weapons, but I don't deal with power. So that's a conundrum that I would love to hear your thoughts on. Um, and just briefly to um, address your issue about fossil fuels or nuclear, um, the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research has a document um, which is carbon-free, nuclear-free in 50 years. So I'll, um, if you want to look that up, it's ieer.org. Um, you know, there's many people that have written about this, so I won't try to um, condense that. But there is, there are plans and roadmaps for how we can move away from nuclear and fossil fuels within a 50-year time period. That might not be quick enough, but there are um, people that are discussing those real terms um, in real terms. And this is specifically from Arjun Makajani addressing this issue to the United States. We have a third hand here. 
I thank you so much for this film. It was very informative um, and alarming <laughs> that that this um, uh, campaign is going on. I was somewhat aware of it, but not. Your film made me more aware of it. And thanks for all the panelists, to all the panelists for all the books you've put out on this subject. I was just wondering if you had in mind producing this film before the Oliver Stone or uh, movie came out, or did that particularly uh, make you want to put make this film? Any panelists want to jump right in? Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'll talk to Kathleen's question a little bit. Um, I think there's a few areas where these issues really clearly line up, right? So the processes to mine uranium are the same and the harms caused by that. The processes to deal with the radioactive waste are the same. And of course, the level of enrichment is different, et cetera, but it's all sort of nuance that we don't need to get into to make the argument because waste is waste. Um, and we can see again here, for example, um, countries that don't have nuclear weapons or nuclear power still having to grapple with the waste question. So I'm thinking of Australia. Um, they only have a small research reactor. They do not possess currently nuclear weapons, um, but they do produce a lot of uranium. And one of the solutions that's being proposed by the US and others is for Australia to just host all of the international high level radioactive waste from weapons and power plants that it doesn't even host. And where would they put that, of course, in their so-called empty outback, right? Which is also where they mine the uranium. And so it's indigenous First Nations communities that are fighting off this idea of having an international waste repository. So all of these things become connected once you start pulling on the threads. And I think the storytelling that's involved of the communities that are fighting are so important to tell because that's really how we can link these things up. But I will say that and of course, then there's the proliferation of the of the materials too, because you use uranium in a bomb the same way that you would in a nuclear reactor. You just have to enrich it more. But once you have the centrifuges for enrichment, you know, this is the whole thing, the drama about is Iran after a nuclear weapon or is it just producing civilian nuclear power? It's because the centrifuges are operating and it just depends how much you enrich them. And then of course you need other facilities to build a bomb. But as we've seen with Canada transferring uh, um, equipment and materials to India led directly to the development of the Indian nuclear weapon program. So there are those direct connections too. But then when we're at the United Nations and we're trying to do things like ban nuclear weapons, you know, we come up against this issue where a lot of countries opposed to nuclear weapons are fully on board with nuclear power and they want to develop nuclear energy and they believe they have an inalienable right is what it's known in the international community to have access to nuclear power. And the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was featured in that film with that very robotic person talking about their verification, kind of freaked me out a little bit. Um, you know, they, they don't just do verification to prevent proliferation they actively promote the development of nuclear power. So the in the industries and agencies um, are biased in that way. They're not being honest about the dangers of the technologies that they're saying on the one hand, they're trying to prevent weapons whilst actively promoting tools for proliferations. Um, just to piggyback on that a little bit, uh, France has Macron infamously about a year ago admitted that the uh, funding of, of nuclear power in France directly funds their weapons program and vice versa. You, they're 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 linked 
financially at these levels that I think a lot of people don't really understand how that how that works. But um, he laid it out very clearly in a, in some comments. Um, as for an example of uh, transitioning to a green economy, I mean, first and foremost, we have to understand we're operating in, in a capitalist society, right? That that consumption is king. Uh, first and foremost, I feel like we need to to really address that. Um, I not a huge fan of Jimmy Carter, it, but we do need to put on our sweaters sometimes, right? Um, but we also can look at Germany. Uh, Germany has a lot of problems. <laughs> some of them were we can talk about later. But they have proposed, and I might be getting some of the numbers wrong, but uh, to transition to a completely carbon-free economy by something like 2030 without nuclear power and without importing power from other nations. Well, it's it's, it's kind of a, an amazing um, thing, especially because they have heavily relied on coal. Um, we'll see if they can be if they're going to be successful. But I think those are sort of um, ideas that are putting into practice, and I think we need to keep an eye on those for examples of how we can transition. Um, as far as developing uh, countries, they've been on the forefront of uh, green. You know the 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 chemtrails of green technologies, uh, whether it's you know mining for copper or lithium, um, of course, uh, for for uranium. Um, right now, there is a, in you know the outback of Russia. They've been mining uranium for for a long time, but with the the sanctions there, they're now looking at places in Wyoming to mine uranium. So it's also in our own backyards. Um, so I think it's really important to think in terms of the impacts of these things, and it's also how do we define what what renewable actually is. Uh, and I think looking at those impacts is really important because the the dams on the Columbia River, for example, which have pretty much led to the extinction of native fish and native salmon um, are considered renewable. <laughs> and I would argue that that's absolutely not a renewable resource, a uh, renewable source of energy. So anyway, I think that was any more questions there. Can I fo follow up a bit, including the question about Oliver Stone's uh, film? I really appreciated your review in Science for the People that compared my movie favorably to Oliver Stone's nuclear now but and that came out um after we were close to completing our film but it uh watching his film it it um reminded me of this kind of quasi religious aspect of of uh belief in nuclear power um it that it's not just about a technical issue and not only about the merits of this technology that start to fall apart when you look very deeply you think how can this industry keep being so heavily subsidized and keep their show on the roads for so long new new scale here in oregon is going under and was kind of the leader of the pack with first phase of um licensing through the nuclear regulatory commission and and yet they keep going and I think it's important to subsidize industries, but the pub that are in the public interest, but the public should control those um, industries and the investments and where our tax money goes. But I think the the perpetual um, the futuristic aura around nuclear energy, even though it's the technology is pretty old, it has a way of exciting the imagination, particularly of young people. Whereas I think a lot of the existing renewable technologies have their own problems with waste, but they're known and we can work with them and yet somehow aren't as exciting as the um, appeal of, nu of nuclear. So I, I do think that's an important problem we address is the how people come to believe in futuristic technologies that have very poor track records but um i think appeal to people out of the and appeal to the anxiety we all feel about the problems we face and looking for uh false redeemers <laughs> uh the review she mentioned is in uh is not in science for the people magazine the print version but it's online so if you can 
look for uh, sciencefortheople.org. Uh, you may find that review there. I see a question here. And there, that's two. One more, three, okay. Yeah, thank you. So, um, well, firstly, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit more when we're discussing um, this kind of necessity to modernize Africa as a means to uplift these smaller economies and developing countries out of poverty um, that we feel maybe responsible for improving educational system and, and things like that. I think one really important thing to remember, I think the rhetoric that we use and the kind of way that we understand this is it, we need to be discussing the issue of colonization and that um, in many ways, this effort to modernize Africa was um, a, ex an experimentation by colonial countries in the past. And I fear that if we are to kind of move forward with that, that position, that we'll be continuing to um, increase this extractive and exploitative culture. Um, and I mean, you brought up the Nile and the industrialization of the Nile itself is the cause of the ongoing malaria um, issue in Africa. The Congo is, is one of the wealthiest countries in the world in natural resources, but has been extracted and exploited by Western governments and private corporations over the past 150 years. So taking those into account, I what I actually want to ask is, how do we approach a, a kind of collective um, global solution to like uplifting, of course, people out of poverty, but also doing so through the means that are requested by the people who live there themselves, you know, like um, going to, a, and this is an abstract, but going to a country and, and giving them technology from the West is in many ways on a kind of more relational perspective, um, an act of colonization as well, because we're continuing to spread Western technologies to non-Western countries or technologies from the global South, or sorry, from the global North to the global South. So my question is, are there pathways towards this, a more like international agreement or to, um, I guess, foreground the perspectives of people who live in poor countries to make these kind of decisions for themselves um, without this constant manipulation from Western corporations and governments. Uh, I don't know if that's a very clear question, but I kind of wanted to problematize this approach in addition to kind of imagining what path forward we might have if we do then um, try to decolonize our mindset. Thank you for the uh, panel and the wonderful movie. Uh, I learned a lot. And uh, I just want to say that I think it was yesterday on BBC television, I, I think it was there that I saw a uh, short clip on hydrogen fuel. We haven't heard much about that for a while. I wonder if that's a living issue or not. Apparently, for the BBC, it is. And um, by the way, I have to make this disclaimer. My name is Marty Goodman, and there's a fellow on the internet also named Marty Goodman, a big nuke advocate, which is not me. Not me. He's a lefty, I'm a lefty, but it's not me. He lives out on the West Coast. Anyway, um, yeah, what, what's the story on hydrogen fuel? Um, thanks for being here and coming together and Jan for making this wonderful film. I found the money related arguments in the movie expect like ex exceptionally convincing the idea that billionaires are not spending their own money on arguing for these technologies and the fact that um, public subsidies is what makes nuclear energy sustainable. 
And because, Ray, you've written about killer robots, I was especially wondering whether there's any link to be made in the critique of capitalism that is coming out of the resisting AI movement. Like, that seems to be very grassroots um, way of bringing people together, putting power back into the hands of the creators of the data that is being exploited by de tech companies. I was wondering if there's any possible synergy between this movement that is historic grassroots and deals with something really tangible like energy versus something that's dealing with something that's nefarious and like really deals with communicative capitalism that is our data, if those linkages are being made and are observable on the ground. Any further comments? That's such a great question. I love that question. And I think the short answer is absolutely there's a relationship. And the organizing principle is really tech won't save us. And that's something that those working against killer robots or autonomous weapon systems or artificial intelligence or surveillance and predictive of policing and all of the software that is algorithmic based um, that categorizes human beings um, in order to incarcerate or police or kill with robots one day um, in the not too distant future. I think that directly relates to this idea that's being, um, you know, propagandized around nuclear energy. And so, yeah, the lesson is tech won't save us. We need to have a better relationship with our, um, with each other, but also with the technologies that we engage with and that we're developing. And um, as someone that is with the Stop Killer Robots campaign, I'm not supposed to talk too much about technology in general because we're not supposed to be Luddites, we're supposed to be tech friendly, but AI in general just freaks me out and I just can't see how in the way society is currently organized, who is building this tech, who is in control of this tech, that it can ever be put to the good use that those saying like tech for good um, always have as their mantra. Um, and so I think within the capitalist system that you mentioned and that Josh mentioned, um, we're not in a in an organized society in which technology has been or can be used um, in a direction that actually services all of humanity, but instead is about directing profit to a minority and about controlling the rest of society. And I think um, in a roundabout way, this relates a little bit to what Mays was talking about too, and I agree completely with your point. And I was thinking about um, the ways that the degrowth movement is so important here because it's sort of like when we're dealing with questions of war and imperialism, right? Like there's this um, instinct perhaps of many well-intentioned people uh, in the West from the US, for example, saying, oh my gosh, we've just gone and we've bombed this country and now we need to do humanitarian aid and we need to develop that country and, and whatnot, instead of actually focusing on what do we need to do here inside the empire to dismantle the empire. And it's very similar, I think, when it comes to this spread of technology, whatever it is, instead, we need to be looking inwards and talking. Um, I think Josh was sort of talking about this with sweaters, but, um, you know, reducing our consumption, con reconfiguring how we use energy um, and that involves dismantling capitalism. So have a great night, everyone. <laughs> Maybe we'll we'll let Jan uh, bat clean up. I'll just uh, have some a little bit more questions. I think that was the last of the questions, right? Um, I think it, it, when we talk about this green transition, because that's really what that's at the heart of this film. It's the heart of this conversation. Um, and of course, the tangential relationship to weapons is very, very important as well. But uh, we all know that climate change is very real. We all know what's contributing to it. Um, but I think what we aren't willing to really address as a culture is radically changing the way we live. 
um, not only because of the energy that we use, but the way that we we get around. It's really, really great. I live I live in Southern California. It's a car culture. Um, the sunshine's great, but the car culture isn't. <laughs> Luckily, I work from home. But it's great to be in New York where people get around in a different way. It's, it's really, um, I think, a, a model for how we need to reconfigure our, our cities. Uh, we po pollute and um, decimate so much by the way we, we get around. I think about what Gavin Newsom, he wants to put you know, another 2 million cars on the road that are electric uh, in five years or something. Or, and it sounds great on paper, but it's absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's not fixing the problem, it's creating another problem. Um, we need to do a massive, a massive investment in reconfiguring our society. And, and, and it starts at the grassroots. It starts at the, where the, the food we eat, where do we get that food? Is it grown locally or is it shipped across, across the ocean? Uh, where are goods produced? You know, all of these things are intricately connected, not only to capitalism, but to our, our consumptive nature. So I think that's really, really an important aspect of this. Um, and lastly, I don't have an answer for the hydrogen question. I, from my own research, it looks kind of like a pie in the sky idea. And, and it fits to this idea that technology can save us. And I don't think there's ever been an example of really um, on a societal level that technology uh, can, can actually save us. Uh, AI is a really complicated thing. Um, there's been some really great advancements in, in the medical field with AI, but as far as, you know, um, <laughs> When it comes to weapons and other things, it's it's really it's really disastrous. So it's it's a it's a delicate balance, like so many things are. And I happen to be a luddite that works on a computer, so um, I'm I'm a walking contradiction. Uh, but Jan <laughs> probably has some things to add. Oops, muted. muted. One thing that came to mind was yesterday, I was getting ready to fly across the country to join you and um, those planes were not working. The whole, the airport was like, everything was chaotic, frozen, everybody desperate to get onto customer service for Delta, seeing where else to fly. And there were no um, taxis, Ubers or anything to get you to the airport even though the, the streets were completely like glass. And these tran, um, the TriMet buses were all over town. And I love these people. <laughs> the, the bus driver stopped, picked us up on the street, took us to the um, next shuttle, and then we got another shuttle. Same thing, leaving the airport to get back. And they were, um, it was quite touching, you know, and I guess it, um, it's, you know, buses aren't very exciting or sexy to people, but let me tell you when you need them, um, it's a really good way to get around. And I think the um, the whole dependency we have on systems of production and um, transportation that are not sustainable in the long run is um, very striking in a crisis where they don't work. Um, I, I just want to say one final thing about um, climate activism and what I've learned working for years now with indigenous communities is the that it's important not only to foreground the 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 destructive forces we're resisting and confronting, but also bring into the picture the the world that we still have a moral responsibility to protect the natural the ecology the natural world the um the beauty of of what remains with us and our moral obligation to protect other non-living uh beings as well as communities that are particularly vulnerable so i wanted some of that to come through in this anti-nuclear film is the beauty of the Columbia Gorge and even the Hanford Reservation, which has it, which is a graveyard of the nuclear industry. But for Yakima people there and many of the other tribes in the region, there's tremendous beauty of that area. And I think that our attachment and love of place 
and of the um, the world we still have responsibility to protect, I think is an important ethos for me. I've come to feel very deeply in my projects and I think needs to be central to our organizing and envisioning um, a different future. I, I think that's an excellent note to wind up on. And uh, thank you, Jan, for being with us. Uh, thanks, Ray and Josh, for joining us tonight. And uh, thank you all for coming out again. Thank you. <laughs>